Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Thank you for joining us. We've been studying over the last um, several weeks, um, laying a foundation, actually, so that we can go on to some very important things for our future. But sometimes you have to um, you have to destroy false doctrines that kind of um, keep people from seeing any reason for going on. You know. Um, any reason for accepting more truth. You know, people that uh, accept false doctrines many times are kind of inoculated from the truth. So we've been studying about um, the end times, about uh, the rapture, the timing of the rapture. If you want to go back and uh, listen to some of the archives, we have them archived, matter of fact, on americaslastdays.com and, and listen there. Uh, we've been talking about, we've pretty well tied down the timing of the rapture and resurrection of the dead by what Jesus said concerning the days of Noah. And, of course, we also know the days of Daniel. And we found out here um, in the last couple of weeks that God told Noah after seven days uh, that the flood was going to come. And, of course, the ark was going to then lift off. And it actually lifted off 40 days later. And those seven days we discovered were the same seven days that Daniel spoke about, the 70th week of Daniel. We also discovered that the days of Daniel and the days of Noah came out to be the same days. Matter of fact, if you started from the beginning of the seven days, the ark lifted off and the resurrection of the dead happened 2,595 days from the time the covenant was made. And that's clear, folks. You can't get out of that. It's, it, it's in black and white, Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 9, um, Genesis chapter 7. If you just want to talk yourself out of it, you can, but you won't be prepared for the things that are coming. Because it's very clear what happened to Israel is going to happen to the church, First Corinthians 10 and 12. Everything that happened to them is for our example. The word example there is type and shadow. So they gave us a type and a shadow. They were a prophecy of the church. Uh, we studied the, the days of unleavened bread. We were talking about the, the feasts and how that um, the last seven days that God's people were in Egypt, which was a type of the world, were called the days of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. Well, I want to talk about another feast here that proves exactly the same thing. All of the feasts, by the way, so, folks, prove that the church is going through the tribulation. All of them do. Okay? If you understand them, they do. And I want to talk to you one to about to you about the uh, marriage feast, which also was seven days, which also represents the seventieth week of Daniel. Okay? You know that after seven days of the marriage feast, God's people will go to the groom's home. Did you know that? We've heard a lot of baloney out there in the church world about the marriage feast and the, the timing of the feast and the timing of the, the virgins and so on and so forth. And, and a lot of people just don't understand the Jewish marriage ceremony. And once you do, and once you even do a little, I mean, it's out there in, in many places, many uh, expositors uh, tell you exactly how they marriage feast worked and the marriage ceremony worked and if you just pay a little bit of attention to it you'll see that the pre-trib rapture is, is not being foretold there at all um, you know Jacob served seven years for each of his wives and he had a marriage feast of seven days for each of them too this is a parallel revelation the seven days represent the last seven years or the 70th week of Daniel okay Samson kept a seven-day marriage feast for his his betrothed 
but he left without taking her on the seventh day, so she was given to another man. That was in Judges 14. Jesus will feast with the bride in spirit for seven years, after which they are escorted by the virgins to the groom's home where she will legally be his. You know, the Hebrew custom is very interesting. Uh, you can look it up in a lot of places. I looked it up, for instance, in, in Zondervan's Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible on page 97 under marriage. Let me read this to you. The bridegroom was the king for a week. Now, isn't that interesting? There's that seven days. Talking about the marriage feast. He was the king for a week, which is, of course, the 70th week of Daniel, the seven days. During the whole week, their majesties, the bride and the bridegroom, wore their festal clothes, did not work, and merely looked on at the games, except that now and then the queen joined in a dance, accompanied by his friends. By the way, John the Baptist was called the friend of the bridegroom. So that was another, um, another one in the marriage ceremony, right? Accompanied by his friends with tambourines and a band, they went to the bride's house, which is obviously on earth, you know. The bride or her father and mother's house was obviously here on earth, right? Uh, where the wedding ceremonies were to start. The bride, richly dressed and adorned with jewels, usually wore a veil, which of course in 1 Corinthians 11 speaks of submission to her husband, right? She wore a veil which she took off only in the bridal chamber. Escorted by her companions, that's the virgins, the bride was led to the home of the bridegroom. Do you know where the bridegroom's home is, folks? It's in heaven, right? Notice that it starts at the bride's home, which is on earth, and ends up in heaven. And, how, and the, uh, while it's on earth, there is a week, the marriage feast was a week long, just like the 70th week of Daniel. He was king for a week. Now, the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible just gives us a little insight into this tradition, but you can see clearly, folks, that the pre-trib all flyaway rapture doesn't fit that. And notice that the, the bride and the virgins together went to the home of the bridegroom which is in heaven. We've been, to, we've been told that the virgins were the bride, and that's obviously not true. Not according to any of the traditions of the Hebrew feasts that I've found, it's not true. This is clear. After seven days of the feast, representing the tribulation, on the eighth day, which is also the day of circumcision, when the flesh is cut off, right, on the eighth day is when the flesh was cut off. They all leave dressed in their new bodies to the groom's home in heaven. Did you know how God's going to dress you for the final ceremony, the marriage supper, and the actual ceremony in heaven? Is He's going to dress you with your new body. That's right. Because circumcision was the cutting off of the flesh on the eighth day. And you know what? Again, there's an eighth day coming, and on the eighth day, the flesh is going to be cut off. Remember we studied how that there were seven days until the flood, and the flood was a year. And Isaiah 34 and 8 says that the vengeance of the Lord is for a year. So there's an eighth day. You see, and on the eighth day, the old flesh is cut off. The people of God are receiving their new body. They're going to the bridegroom's home. Okay? That the Lord takes his people after seven days day slash years of the marriage feast is clearly proven by the scriptures everywhere as a matter of fact in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 where it talks about the great multitude out of every nation and tribe and people and tongue standing before the throne and before the Lamb it goes on in verse 14 to say these are they that came out of the great tribulation now you know the people that come out of the Great Tribulation, how are they coming out? Well, they're either we that are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, which is at the end of the Great Tribulation, or they're dying 
and being resurrected at the end of the Great Tribulation. But it's still at the end of the Great Tribulation. Um, well, after the Great Tribulation, this great multitude that is made up of all who attend the marriage announced that the bride is ready and the, and the marriage has come. That's in Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and 1 says, And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude in heaven. There it is, the great multitude before the throne, exactly what we saw in Revelation 7. And these are the people that came out of the Great Tribulation. So now you're talking about the same people here. I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude in heaven. In verse 7, The marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Uh-oh. Now you got the bride making herself ready at the end of the tribulation. And Revelation 19 is at the end of the tribulation. And by the way, it goes on, verse 8, to say, And it was given to her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. You know what the word bright is there? It's the word lampros. The Greek word lampros, it means brilliant, glowing. It says, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now you know how to get prepared for this. She hath made herself ready. The righteous acts of the saints. That's what gives us this brilliant garment, folks. By the way, if you go on down into verse 9, it says, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, you know, folks, the people that are invited to the marriage supper, that's not the bride, because the bride is one of the ones that invites. See, these are the people that are invited. Matter of fact, it even tells you the color of their garment. If you go down in verse 14, it says, The armies which are in heaven follow him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and pure. Notice the, the fine linen that they're clothed with is white. It's not bright, it's white. It's the word leucos. It means just white. Well, you say, well, how come the bride is dressed in the glowing white garment and these are just dressed in a white garment? Because these are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're the great multitude that said the bride hath made herself ready. Notice the great multitude that's standing before the throne is speaking about the bride. They are not the bride. They are speaking about the bride. As a matter of fact, they even have a different colored garment. You say, well, why would they be going to war and, and not the bride? Because their garment is a different colored garment. And the garment is what? The righteous acts of the saints. See, the bride is so beautiful to God is because she, she walks in righteousness. You say, well, why are these other people following him as his army? Well, did you ever see a king go to war with his wife next to him? Never. In all the Bible. It's, it's funny that God always uses the natural things to, to describe what he does. See? They're parables. See? No, the kings go to war with their armies, but the wife don't go. To tell you the truth, folks, the bride has been fighting enough. The tribulation period, the, the, the bride has been fighting for the people of God. If you read the book of Esther, you'll know what I'm talking about. You read the book of Song of Solomon, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? Again, you know, it says, Blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Different word here. You see, the marriage supper is in heaven, but the marriage feast is on earth. Let's go back and look at this marriage feast a little bit. Those who are obedient to attend will feast on the unleavened bread of the pure word and the pure wine of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the what's gonna be what the marriage feast is gonna be made up of here on earth? Jesus said, Except you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You understand what is his body? What does his body represent? He was the word made flesh. He was the Word made flesh. If you're going to eat his body, you've got to devour his Word. And he said, except you drink my blood, you have no life in you. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh, which is the Word, is the wine that's served at the marriage feast. 
Remember the wine represents the blood in the marriage supper? In the last supper, excuse me? So let me point that out to you. Matthew chapter 22. Did you know that the marriage feast is on the earth? Most people don't know that, but the Bible's pretty plain about it. Jesus gives a parable about it in Matthew 22. And he says, And Jesus answered and spake again in parables unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king who made a marriage feast for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the marriage feast. Well, call and bidden is the word kaleo, and it means invited. See, where do we get our invitation to the marriage feast? Well, of course, here on earth is where we get our invitation. And they would not come. In other words, they would not come to the marriage feast here on earth. They would not come. And again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them that were bidden, Behold, I have made ready my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. In other words, they were distracted by the things of the world, the love of the world. They wouldn't come and feast on the marriage feast, which I, I tell you what the Lord told me. It's the body and blood of Christ. Okay, Verse 6. And the rest laid hold on his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. Well, that happened to the disciples. I mean, so far, it's a prophecy of what happened in Jesus' day, right? And verse 7 says, But the king was wroth. He sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Well, that happened in 70 A.D. It's exactly what the Lord did after they killed his disciples, killed the Lord Jesus. He sent his armies, destroyed them, those murderers. Okay, so now the scene changes. That's, that's, that was Jesus offering the marriage feast to the Jews. You understand that when Jesus was preaching the gospel, if they would come and partake of the bread and the wine that he was serving, and, and I think Proverbs chapter 9 talks about the bread and the wine that's being served. But wisdom serves it. But the Bible calls Jesus the wisdom of God three times. Yeah. So if they would have come and partaken of the wisdom that Jesus, that he was serving, they would have been partaking of the marriage feast. Verse 8 goes on to say, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the partings of the highways, and as many as you find, bid to the marriage feast. And those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with guests. Why would it be bad and good? Well, to a Jew, a bad would be a Gentile, right? And a good would be a Jew. To them, that's the way it would be. Well... Notice, they were going out to gather the Gentiles to come to the marriage feast. Again, the marriage feast is on the earth. The marriage feast is for seven days. Okay, just like the marriage feast was all through the, the Old Testament, okay? Another point I want to make to you is what John the Baptist said in John chapter 3 and verse 29. He said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom that standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is made full. So there you have three of the people that come to the marriage feast and the marriage ceremony. Okay, so he is talking about the marriage here. And he said that he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. In other words, as a type and as a shadow, the Lord told me one day that everything that happened in the Gospels and in the book of Acts was going to happen again in the end time, except the cast of characters is multiplied many times over. That's what he told me. So what happened in Jesus' day is going to happen in our day. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Well, you know, in this little type or shadow that John is showing us, uh, he's pointing out that the feast was being shared right there. 
And he, he rejoiced at the bridegroom's voice. Why? This is how the feast is shared, you see. This is how Jesus shared the feast, that they had to come unto him and partake of his body and blood. Body being the word of God, blood being the life in the word. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? So the life of the flesh, in that case, would be the life of the word. It, you know, some people have a dead word, don't they? They have a word that has no power, don't they? They have a word that really is just dead letter and not the spirit, don't they? So you have to have both. So today, of course, the last seven days, which is the tribulation period, the Lord is going to begin to share again this unleavened bread, which is again the last seven days, the unleavened bread of the Word of God, which is this feast that the Lord's going to share. After the feast, everyone who is sanctified has to be ready to leave and go to the groom's home, which is, of course, in heaven, right? Okay, Luke chapter 12 and verse 36 says, And be ye yourselves like unto men looking for the Lord when he shall return from the marriage feast. Well, you see, why did they put that word return in there? I want to tell you why. Translators put that in there. But the same translators translated this same word everywhere else, um, depart. For instance, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23, where Paul speaks of his departing from this life, that same word, ana luo, is translated depart. Why wouldn't they have translated it depart here? Because they thought the marriage feast was in heaven and that the Lord was coming back from the marriage feast. Well, but the marriage feast is for seven days, and we just saw that it's on the earth. Even John the Baptist was saying that. So when we read this correctly, be yourselves like unto men looking for the Lord when he shall depart from the marriage feast. You see, because when the Lord departs from the marriage feast, that's when all the escorts, that's when the bride, the virgins, the friend of the bridegrooms, that's when they all go to be, when they go to the groom's home. And it goes on to say that when he cometh and knocketh, they may straightway open unto him. Hey, that sounds just like Matthew chapter 25, doesn't it? Because it's talking about the same thing. You know, the encyclopedia is pretty clear that the groom, his bride, and his friends depart from a marriage feast of seven days and are escorted by the virgins to the home, to his home in heaven. Matthew 25 and verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, our common false teaching here is that the virgins are the bride who leave before the seven-year tribulation. But obviously, the virgins escort the bride after the seven-day feast. See? What they're saying is contrary to the Hebrew custom that I just cited from the encyclopedia, and it's contrary to everything else the Bible says, and it's contrary to other experts. Let me quote to you here from uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersham, a very famous book, book three and chapter four. And he says, and he's talking about this Hebrew custom here. On the evening of the actual marriage, which is, of course, after the seven-day marriage feast, the bride was led from her paternal home, that's the home of her parents, where, who, you know, the, the, the parents of the bride live on the earth, folks, okay, to that of her husband, which is obviously in heaven, the groom's home, covered with a bridal veil, her long hair flowing, surrounded by her companions, that's the virgins, and led by the friends of the bridegroom, of whom John the Baptist said he was one. Some carried torches or lamps on poles. That's where the ten lamps come in, right? Or supposed to be the ten lamps. So there you have it, folks. It's very plain from their own marriage custom. It's clear here that the bride 
and the virgins are two separate entities. And that after a seven-day or a seven-year marriage feast, the virgins will accompany the bride to the groom's home. Edersham, in his, in his book uh, 5, chapter 6, explains the parable of the ten virgins with their lamps. He said, According to the Jewish authorities, it was the custom in the East to carry in a bridal procession about ten such lamps. Ten was the number required to present at any officer ceremony. You understand they had to have witnesses to the kathuba, which was the marriage document. And these were ten witnesses to the kathuba, the, the signing of the marriage document. Now also, Edersham goes on to say, the ordinary Jewish marriage procession is where the bridegroom, accompanied by his groomsmen or the friends, went to the bride's house and from thence conducted the bride with her attendant maidens into his own or his parents' home. Again, you're seeing it again, folks. You know, after the marriage feast, the groom, the friends of the bridegroom, the virgins, and the bride go to the groom's home. That doesn't fit at all what they've been telling us, to try to jam their false doctrine and, and uh, foul up the, the marriage ceremony. What we, what we find in here is there's a seven-year marriage feast, a procession to the groom's home, and a marriage supper, and the signing of the ketuba. Right? From the common Aramaic language in the time of Christ, there was an Easter text called the Peshitta, which means true or straight. A few people believe that this was the original language that the New Testament was written in, but I've got news for you, folks. Bible numerics proves that the original was in Greek. There's a perfect numeric pattern in the Greek, and in no other writing is there. But the thing about the Aramaic language in the Peshitta text or the Eastern text was it was written by the people themselves. It was, a, it was obviously a copy, but it was written by the people themselves, and it would have followed the marriage custom. Okay? The, the Peshitta text was limited to, to the Middle Eastern culture and is used in the Lamza New Testament, which I have, a Lamza New Testament. Let me, let me tell you how it quotes Matthew 25 and 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom and the bride. Now, isn't that interesting? According to, now, surely you wouldn't think that the people who spoke the Aramaic language, the Middle Eastern people, would not describe their own marriage ceremony correctly, right? Okay? Uh, but they said that the ten virgins took their lamps and went out to, to greet the bridegroom and the bride. And I want to point out to you that I'm not saying that that's correct. I'm just saying that the Middle Easterners did write this, and they would have written it according to their own custom. They would not write something that was silly, okay? Um, I'm not saying that and the bride is added into, it should be added into our Bible, but it definitely was in the Eastern manuscripts. And the reason I'm not saying that is because in the Greek it's not there. But you see, Gentiles, Gentiles can gain something from the custom by reading this, you see. It's not necessary for it to be in there. The Jews all knew that the ten virgins were escorting the bride and the bridegroom. The Jews all knew that, okay? It's the Gentiles that don't know that, okay? But this custom this uh, custom that's written in the Lamsa text is clear. This gives witness, too, that the virgins escort the bride and the groom to the groom's home after the marriage feast. This witness is against false teaching that the virgins are the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Because as you can see, the virgins aren't the church. They're only a small portion of the church. There's the friends of the bridegroom, 
There's the bride. There's the virgins. We've been taught, we've heard many, many times that the virgins are the bride. That's ridiculous. It doesn't fit anything that any of the experts say. It doesn't fit anything that the Bible says. Let's read Matthew 25 and 1 again <clears throat> in my Bible. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 6, But at midnight there is a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come ye forth to meet him. Notice, they're getting ready to leave at midnight. You know, after all the judgments that were upon Egypt, which was a type of the world, after all those judgments came, there was one final judgment that came that was called the Passover. This was a, a type of the final judgment after the tribulation called the flood or the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a year, Isaiah 34 and 8. Okay. At this time, this is the eighth day. This is the eighth year. It's the year in which the, the ark was sitting on the earth for 40 days into this year before it lifted off. Okay. At this time, the Israelites who ate the lamb were spared and got ready to leave their world of Egypt at midnight. Exodus 12 and 29. It came to pass at midnight that the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Verse 31. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people. So at midnight, they were leaving Egypt, which was a type of the world. That's kind of interesting. At midnight... The virgins were escorting the bride and the bridegroom out of this world. And at midnight, the people of God were leaving Egypt, and the God of this world, who was Pharaoh at the time, represented He was saying, yeah, go. <laughs> now, I know they didn't physically cross the border at that hour, but the type is spoken there. And that's what's important. In this type, midnight was the beginning of a new day. You say, well, not to the Jews, David. I know, but but to the church it is. And did you know the church is the overwhelming majority of the people that will be leaving at midnight are Gentiles. The overwhelming majority. And we know that the things hap that happened unto them were for our type. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. So wouldn't he be speaking to Gentile here? Wouldn't he be speaking to the church here? In this type, midnight was the beginning of a new day, which is overwhelmingly Gentile. Midnight also represented the end of their tribulations in Egypt, which was a type of the world. Also, in the parable of the laborers of the vineyard, Jesus hired the last servants to go to work in his vineyard, which is where? On the earth, right? He hired the last workers at the 11th hour, Matthew 20 and verse 9. And they only worked for one hour, verse 12. The 12th hour was the end, not the beginning. Notice, it was the end of their service in the Lord's vineyard. The 12th hour was. is the end, not the beginning. I want you to notice that the beast of the second three and a half years in Revelation 13 is said to rule for one hour in Revelation 17. And this last hour is the time of the flood. The virgins and the bride and the bridegroom all take flight at the end of the tribulation period, 40 days after the end of the tribulation period. So the beast rules for that one last hour. And then it's over, folks. See, they left at midnight meaning the end of the tribulation, the end of their Egyptian tribulation. And the, the virgins leave at midnight, escorting the bride at the end of one day, the beginning of a new day. And by the way, at the end of the twelfth hour is when the Lord reckoned with his servants, and he gave them their reward. 
clearly telling you that it's at the end of the tribulation period, not the beginning. Another possible objection to what I'm saying is that, that some translations have the wise virgins leaving with the groom to go to the marriage feast, which is not the custom at all. Matthew 25 and verse 10 says, And while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. Oh, now, let me point something out to you. The word marriage feast here is the Greek word gamos. If you look, for instance, in Vine's Expositor Dictionary or quite a few others, you'll find that gamos does not, should not be translated marriage feast, but marriage, just marriage. It, it actually described the whole ceremony from beginning to end. The word gamos did. So, and while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready with him went into the marriage. They weren't going to the marriage feast as we saw in Luke 12. They were coming from the marriage feast. He said, get ready like unto your Lord when he shall return, return from the marriage feast. Returning from the marriage feast is where they leave to go to the marriage. Okay? Game house is used all over the New Testament to cover the marriage feast. You know, I want to make a point right here. The game house is used all over the New Testament to cover the marriage feast, the marriage procession, and the marriage supper in the groom's home. So it covered all three of those, the whole marriage from beginning to end. The text and the Jewish marriage tradition should decide which part of the marriage is being spoken of, not personal rapture doctrines. See why they start adding words into the Bible like that, like um, like we saw in Luke chapter 12, Luke 12 and 36, depart from the marriage feast, or, or return from the marriage feast instead of depart from it. All right? You look it up, you'll find it's depart. Why do they put a word in there that they haven't translated that way anywhere else in the Bible? I'll tell you why. The translators have their own doctrines. And don't tell me it doesn't get into their translation. It does. It gets into their translation. They can't help it. They know it just can't mean that. So they just put it the way they want to put it, you know. That's why a little studying will help you, folks. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing and it's the glory of kings to seek it out. Sometimes you have to seek the truth to find it. Don't think that man's hand in anything is good because it's not. So it, even in, in all the text and in the Jewish marriage tradition, you have to look at the text to see what he's talking about. Listen, the only official capacity for the virgins is after the marriage feast, in the marriage procession to the groom's home, which is where they witness the signing of the legal marriage document called the Cathuba. That's their only official capacity. Notice that the feasts are types which are fulfilled during the same seven days, which is the tribulation, after which the Lord comes for his people in every case. Remember that we looked at the unleavened bread and the marriage. The unleavened bread, the, the feast of unleavened bread. After seven days of unleavened bread, they actually crossed out of, out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, came out of Egypt. You see, a pre-tribulation all flyaway rapture is impossible to fit into any of these types. Now, we're going to look at a few more feasts. They clearly point out the same thing. Probably won't do it today, but we will look into some of them. And then I'd like to get into some more important things, like how do you get prepared for this tribulation? First of all, to know that there is a difference between the bride and the virgins is very important. You see, the truth always motivates to holiness, but the lie, it covers over a lot. 
Wouldn't you like to be in the bride? Wouldn't you like to be in the first fruits? Listen, I challenge you to look anywhere in the Bible. You can look in, in Esther, for instance. Esther was the bride. She was chosen from among all the fair virgins. She was the most beautiful of all of them. And we just saw what beauty was to the Lord. She was dressed up in this beautiful glowing garment, which is the righteous act of the saints. And what did Esther do? Did she fly away? Oh, no. She had a job to do. What was her job? Well, her job was to save the people of God from the beast. Her job was there to minister to the people of God. She stood before the king for the people of God. She was used to save them. She spoke the word of faith to them. She got authority from the king, who had given authority from the beast to persecute them. He also gave authority to the bride to give them authority to stand for their lives. Or, if you'd like to look in Psalm 45, you see that the bride comes into the king's house, and then he leads the virgins. She leads the virgins into the king's house. Now, the bride represents the first fruits of God's people to come to maturity. Not the only fruits, just the first fruits. But just as our Lord Jesus came to lead disciples into his own relationship with the Father, his own authority, his own power, his own gifts, that's the job of the first fruits all the way through the Bible. Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, you saw the Shulamite, which means the perfected one. The Shulamite is running after her Lord. You know, it, it goes on to say that there's three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. But my love, my undefiled, is one. See, the bride was not the virgins. Nowhere in the Bible is the bride the virgin. The bride is not the church, folks. The bride is the first fruits of the church. You say, well, how come it looks like we're the bride in Ephesians and so on? But let me tell you, we all have the position of being the bride when we come into the kingdom. But that doesn't mean we're going to manifest that position. What God has given to you has nothing to do with whether you will manifest it or not. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews that he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Does that mean that you're going to attain to that perfection? Well, obviously the bride pertains to, attains to that per perfection. The word perfection is also the word maturity and uh, full grown. It's all be, also been translated in those ways, you know. The bride attained to it. But the virgins didn't. The queens and concubines didn't. Song of Solomon. Obviously, folks, it's there for us. The Lord at the cross perfected us already. All we have to do is walk by faith in what he did. All we have to do is walk in obedience. You know, the righteous acts of the saints is this uh, uh, Lampros garment the righteous acts of the saints wouldn't you like to be among the first fruits there's obviously an advantage to be in the bride and not the virgins closer walk with the Lord right we don't see anywhere that the bride is going through persecution or death in the Bible they're obviously preserved like the man-child, who's also another type of the first fruits in Revelation chapter 12. There's an advantage to being the first fruits. You know, the Philadelphia church was a, a first fruits unto God. They were like a pillar in the temple of God. They didn't go out anymore. They abided in the temple of God consistently, like a pillar. They were stable. They were the church of brotherly love, right? They had a special promise that they would escape the hour of trial. 
no um, Esther escaped the tribulations that came upon the virgins because she was in the king's house. I wasn't talking about she was in heaven. She was abiding in the king's house. She was abiding in the temple. She was like a pillar. Some people think, oh, we're going to escape. We're going to fly away. Listen, every first fruits in the Bible had a job to do, and not one of them flew away. Not one of them. We see Moses, who was a, who was a first fruits. You know, he went to the mountain of God, received from God authority to go and bring his people through that wilderness to the same mountain. We see Abraham, who was a first fruits, who went into Canaan's land, the promised land, and came came back to save Lot from the hand of the kings which represents the beast in Revelation 17, the beast who was attacking God's people. Saved him out of the hand of the beast, kind of like Esther saved the people of God from the beast. And then, along with Lot, who had saved out of the hand of the beast, he met Melchizedek in the promised land. He was facing God after saving the people of God. See, every time there's a first fruits in the Bible, Joseph, Joseph what? Save the people of God through seven years of famine. Every time there's a first fruits, they don't escape the seven years. They have a job to do in the seven years. They have authority. They've been caught up to the throne of God in a position of authority, and there will be a physical catching up too, but but they have a a place of authority. He that he that overcometh, Jesus said will sit down with me in my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. And I know a lot of people think that's in the way by and by, in the future sometime, you know. But but folks, if you're an overcomer, you enter into God's authority on this earth. You administer his authority. You're able to bind and loose. Well, I thought we all had the authority. We all have the authority, but we're not all doing it. A person that's overcoming is a person that's doing it. You know, if you have bold faith towards God, it's, for one thing, you have a clean heart. If a heart condemns us not, we have boldness towards God, the Bible says. See, holiness is going to save a lot of people in the days to come, and it's going to cause them to be bold, to exercise the authority of God, just like they were seated with Jesus in the throne. I had, an, I had an experience years ago where the Lord took me to the throne of God. And it was very strange because the throne of God was on top of a mountain on this earth. The mountain wasn't a physical mountain. It was a spiritual mountain, kind of like Zion is in Hebrews chapter 12. Like Paul said, you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. He was talking about those who were born again. He said, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's what he called coming to the the heavenly Jerusalem. Anyway, I went to the top of this mountain and I saw the new Jerusalem and I entered in and I actually saw the Lord there. And I'm making this short because I'm running out of time. But um, it was a mountain on this earth. It wasn't a mountain up in heaven. See, the kingdom of God is here on the earth, folks. And um, I saw Jesus sitting on the throne of David And I went over to him, and I sat down with him on his throne. And I began to ask him questions. And he began to tell me some answers. And you know, one thing while I was sitting there with him in this vision, um, I heard a noise. And I turned behind me to see what the noise was, and I saw men trying to climb into this throne room up another way. You remember in John chapter 10 how that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had come up another way and not through the door, Jesus said? What was he talking about? He was talking about to a position of authority. These people had stolen the position of authority. They hadn't earned it by being an overcomer, by doing what they were preaching. In fact, that's what Jesus told them they weren't doing is obeying what they were preaching. And when I saw these men trying to come up another way, 
It was like a window or something. They were coming in, trying to come into the throne room. Jesus said to me, he said, don't worry, they can't come in here. You know something, folks? In these days, there are people who have taken a position of authority. It's kind of a letter position of authority. They don't really have the authority of Jesus Christ. Like the Pharisees were given a position of authority, but they didn't have the authority that Jesus had. Uh, the authority to bind and loose for God Almighty. The authority to um, heal the sick, cast out devils. The authority to lead the true disciples of Christ. Everyone who came out from among that old harlot of Judaism followed Jesus. They were the true church, which means the called out ones. They came out. A remnant came out, and they followed Jesus. And they received that same authority. He was like he was leading them to the throne of God, too. They received the same authority and exercised it. You know, folks, one thing that's about to happen is the same thing. There's a man-child, a first fruits. It's about to come on the scene. It's the first fruits company of people. It's going to come on the scene. It's going to teach the unleavened bread once more that Jesus taught. You know, the, the tribulation is entering into the days of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, after which the church is going to go to be with the Lord. So the man-child is going to teach this unleavened bread, raise up disciples in the image of Jesus Christ, with the authority of Jesus Christ, the power, and these are in turn going to go forth and um, spread this revival to the whole world. We're coming to a great time. You know, many of the people of God, they want to escape this coming time because the only thing they know about tribulation is they don't want anything to do with it. They're afraid of it. But look, you don't want to miss this, folks. What happened in the days of Jesus and his apostles is about to happen again except on a worldwide scale. The same thing is about to happen. You don't want to miss this. God's going to restore everything that's been stolen from his church for 2,000 years. That's what the latter rain is all about, which comes on the morning of the third day, which is where we are now. We've just come to the morning of the third day. The latter rain starts here. Joel said the latter rain was to restore all things. You see, everything that's been taken from the church from the church for 2,000 years. See, the former reign <clears throat> through the man-child Jesus restored everything to the Jews who were a remnant that came out from among them. The latter reign that's going to first come through the man-child is going to be to restore a remnant that will come out from apostate Christianity, just like a remnant came out of apostate Judaism. Listen, folks, you want to be in that remnant. You want to come out from among the apostate daughters of the harlot. You want to follow Jesus Christ. You want to see the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the provisions that are about to come forth in the days to come. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. The church has told you nothing but fear about the tribulation. Tribulation is for the saints. Wrath is not for the saints. The wrath follows the tribulation. The wrath is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Isaiah 34 and 8, this follows the tribulation. Get ready. Great things are coming, folks.